All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're so glad that you could join us this morning for Beta Bagels. Um, let's get things started. And uh, we're recording this event, so if you'd like to be on camera, um, turn your cameras on. If you prefer not to be, uh, turn your cameras off. My name is Kate Nicholson. I'm from Beta NYC, and my pronouns are she, her. Today is Wednesday, June 5th, 2024, and we are hosting Beta Bagels with guests from the MTA's Open Data team. This is today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna share some welcoming information and then hand the floor over to our guests to present. Then we'll have time for some discussion and Q&A and we're gonna end with some community announcements. So save all your job announcements or looking for jobs uh, announcements at the, for the end. Uh, just a few reminders, please stay muted. Use the raised hand function feature um, if you want to chat. Uh, please turn your cameras on. We love to see people in the little boxes. Use the chat to ask questions. Um, good behavior only. And uh, this event is recorded. Thank you. So to kick things off, I wanted to briefly introduce Beta NYC. I think there's some new faces in the room, so it's always nice to start that way. Uh, we are a civic technology nonprofit organization. We're a team of New Yorkers five full-time staff and five associates. And every year we have a handful of civic innovation fellows throughout the year. Uh, we'd love to know who you are, so please let us know in the chat. Our mission is to make it easier for all New Yorkers to access information and use open data to improve their communities and hold decision makers accountable. We want our government to work for the people, by the people, for the digital era. And you know, it's been a long, uh, a long journey that we've had. Uh, we started as a meetup of civic hackers back in 20, uh, in 2009. And ever since we've been organizing, building core programs and growing New York City's public interest technology community. So um, hopefully, uh, maybe we've seen you at events or other programs that we've uh, had in the past. Today, um, we do three core things. We work in partnership with New Yorkers and local, local government doing them. Um, the first thing that we do is we're building a civic technology talent pipeline through our Civic Innovation Fellowship. Uh, the fellowship trains CUNY students in civics and data analytics. You may have met some of them through their mapping for equity work uh, this year. Our Civic Innovation Lab responds to the needs of local communities and stakeholders, and they produce data-driven reports and analyses tools and other solutions that end up being quite useful for many New Yorkers, like uh, our boundaries map, which shows all the political and administrative boundaries of New York City. Our public programs get more people interested in open data and civics. We're addressing data literacy gaps across the city and bringing a community of awesome people like you together to learn and work. Some of you might be familiar with Open Data Week or School of Data um, or this series, Beta Bagels. Uh, Beta Bagels is one of the ways that we bring people together to engage with government. It's a breakfast salon series organized by Beta NYC for New Yorkers to engage in dialogue with local government. Each event features government employees or local leaders who are using technology, data, or design to transform New York City from the inside out. The first event took place back in 2018, and ever since we've had a lot of conversations with government offices and data labs and we're looking forward to today's conversation. Um, as we begin, I'd like to say thank you to the sponsors who make uh, Beta NYC and supporters who make Beta NYC's work possible, uh, including public events like these, and a special shout out to the folks over in LA who started Data Donuts, which inspired this event series way back when. So today, we have some great guests from the MTA they're the team who's recently responsible for publishing MTA's open data. Um, if you, I, I'm curious to know how many of you are familiar with their data or if you're just hearing about it and um, if you've worked with it. So let us know in the chat um, how familiar you are with it. Uh, either way, you're in the right place. We're going to learn what MTA open data is and we're going to get a close up look at some of their recently published data sets and how to use them. But before we introduce our guests, I wanna take a moment to recognize the history of advocacy efforts that brought us this easy access to MTA data today. It's kind of like an obvious, like we should have it, but it's also kind of a monumental like thing to have it today. So I'm gonna ask my colleague, Noel Hidalgo, how did we get here? And what did advocacy groups and passionate individuals um, do to help pave this the way to where we are? 
So, Noel. Thanks, Kate. How's it going, everybody? Um, uh, as Kate indicated on the timeline, um, do you mind going to the next slide? Um, as indicated on the timeline, uh, we got together uh, back in 2008, 2009. Um, at that time period in New York City, there was no open data program either at the city, at the state. Uh, there was this inclination from then Mayor Bloomberg that we that he wanted to leverage the city's information to start small businesses. This was still the very beginning of the Web 2.0 era. Um, and so in 2009, when we were getting started, Amazon Web Services had recently been launched. The iPhone, Android, the app stores, these were all things that were coming out of our pockets and into our hands and really permeating kind of our, our, our existence. What was interesting um, with the MTA is that the MTA had an existing developers program. Um, they actually would license their logo and license their data um, for a cost. Um, there was an individual uh, who was looking to essentially make his BlackBerry more useful, um, and he had a timetables app on his BlackBerry. Um, when the iPhone came out, he decided that he was going to more or less make that app, which had been a very successful and popular app for, for commuters um, uh, for Metro North, to go ahead and put it, put it on the iPhone and, and start charging $299. Um, the MTA said, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, we have an ex existing developers uh, agreement, so we need you to pay us essentially for all past and future licensing fees. Um, and so leading up into the summer of 2009, uh, then the Open Planning Project, now known as Open Plans, had led a series of events. They were using the Freedom of Information Act to essentially liberate MTA data and then put that up on um, this new fangle dangled website called GitHub. Um, and essentially like use the process of open government practices to liberate our train data and our information data. Um, I mean, this was at a time period when the NYPD said that it was, if you started documenting where subway entrances were, you were a terrorist. Um, and so in September of 2009, there was a very, very uh, uh, abrupt change of position from the MTA. The MTA went from essentially wanting to sue application developers and telling everybody that they had to pay um, uh, to develop apps to all of a sudden saying, uh, actually, this is a, a great opportunity to make our system more useful. Um, and so by the middle of 2010, go then Governor Patterson uh, said, hey, I'm going to go ahead and with Jay Walder, we're going to have a new era in the MTA and we're going to start publishing our data freely available. We're going we're gonna to encourage application developers to come take our administrative data our operational data, our timetables data, and we want you to essentially power a new generation of tools that makes the system more useful for all New Yorkers. And can we go to the next slide? Um, and so that took us um, all the way. We essentially, you know, you for those of you who've been around, you've seen the infrastructure that we had. Um, and then in, in 2020, 21, um, with the new governor, uh, Governor Hochul, we had an opportunity to get a bunch of some of the same good government groups who had quietly lobbied uh, for opening up the MTA data uh, to create a very specific piece of legislation because the state doesn't have an open data law uh, that would target the MTA. We knew that if we were going to get congestion pricing, we knew that if we were wanting to really make sure that our MTA had the fiscal transparency and it had the backbone to ensure that we would all have the transportation resources that we needed to get around the city, that we needed to make sure that the MTA was going to be completely transparent. Um, so this coalition got together and thanks to Senator Comrie and Assemblymember Carroll, uh, this MTA Open Data Act was introduced in 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 uh, 2021. It got passed at the beginning um, in the legislative session for 2021, and that creates the state's first open data law um, that exclusively applies to the MTA, and that helps us introduce the new era that we're in. And so we are very very happy 
to have this wonderful team at the MTA to have legislation that essentially that they can stand on that helps them share uh, the information that we desperately need to make sure that our transit system is accessible, um, it's operational, it's funded, um, and it's usable in the pocket of our hands um, or the in our pockets and in our hands, excuse me. Um, I'm excited to have this opportunity to bring the MTA team uh, to us to talk about all of the great data that they are so, uh, so uh, dedicated to supporting and making sure that it's clean and that it's usable um, and that will help us step into the middle part of the century uh, to have a really clean open data program at the MTA. Um, and with that, I hand it back to Kate Nicholson. Thank you. Thank you, Noel, um, for that great introduction. Yeah, um, I can't believe it's the middle of the century almost. Um, well, not almost, but <laughs> uh, we're, we're moving that way. Um, so like we said, we are joined by the folks that are spearheading the MTA's open data efforts, and we're excited for you to get to know them. So I'd like to introduce now uh, John Kaufman, the MTA's Chief of Strategic Initiatives, Lisa Fielder, their Open Data Manager, and Nikki Karamat, a senior data scientist at the MTA. And without further ado, the floor is yours. And um, don't forget to tell us what your favorite bagel is, since this is Beta Bagels. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And, and thank you, Noel, for the, the context, I think for everybody to, to remember. I, I think many people are maybe newer to the party than, than you, but I think it's really important to understand the journey that this has been as context for what we're gonna talk about today. Um, first, my name is John Kaufman. I'm the uh, Chief of Strategic Initiatives uh, as mentioned, and, and uh, one of the teams that uh, I get the pleasure of supervising is the MTA data and analytics team. Um, this is uh, actually a new team that, that we created about a couple of years ago, um, the brainchild of, of Andy Kujemko, who's also on this call, uh, and someone who feels passionately not just about data, but but making it available internally to the MTA so that people can use it to make better decisions. And his broader team, you know, looks to you know centralize a lot of the analytics that was happening across the MTA, or at least centralizes the management of data so that anybody can get to it a lot easier than before. You know, and that ethos of sharing information broadly to in empower people is something he believes strongly in, and also something that he's you know empowered his team to do under, under the direct supervision of Lisa, who manages the open data program itself, with, which is a lot of our external facing open data. Um, the reality is there's actually not a big difference between the, how we manage it internally and externally. And that's kind of part of the ethos is like, whatever we're using, we want to put it out there for the public to use as well. And again, we set up these data sets in mind that when Lisa publishes it, it's for internal use as well. And we're really trying to bring that philosophy to how the MTA thinks about data. And um, there's nothing so special about what we're doing that shouldn't be shared. We're a you know, tax supported entity. Um, and we want to organize data both for ourselves to use it better, but also for the public to get at it if they want to get at it. And so again, I, I think that my my role in this is to keep sponsoring that effort overall. Um, other parts of my team use actively use that data and analytics that Andy's team brings and uses the open data sites that Lisa has been um, dr uh, driving out there with their team. But I want you know folks to understand that it really is a new chapter here at the MTA of how we're thinking about organizing our own data and making it available for the public. Um, let me let, let Lisa talk just a, a little bit and then introduce the other folks who are going to talk today, and then I'll, I'll give you a little more of an overview. Yeah, hi. Great to see everybody. So my name is Lisa. I am the MTA Open Data Manager. Um, on this slide, I'm dressed as a bus to try and give myself some transportation kudos with our friends here. Uh, yeah, and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Beta Bagels, for giving us this platform. Uh, we'll dig into the data sets in a bit. And I just want to pass to Nikki to introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikki. I'm a data scientist on Lisa's team, the open data team. Um, it's been a great time at the MTA so far, and we're really excited to talk about the budget data sets later. The, a couple of other people that are on this call, uh, Renuma, who works on Lisa's team, and Shaul, who also has been co contributing you know, our key members along with Nikki to kind of make what everything you're talking about happen and kind of the internal work that's necessary to do that and to do it sort of reliably. Um, so uh, again, I appreciate it. It's really been a, a team effort here and I'll, I'll do some of the big picture talking, but it, it really is you know, coming bottoms up in the day in, day out work uh, of Lisa and her team. Um, I, before I go on, I, I guess I need to say my favorite bagel is uh, everything bagel, usually whole wheat. Uh, and as it says here, you know, the, you know, we are, 
all users of uh, the MTA regularly, you can imagine. Um, I put Court Square, 23rd Street, as my favorite station. Although I live in Brooklyn, I find that that station is always super useful for connecting between Brooklyn and Queens, getting to the city, getting out to see the Mets, or stuff that's going on at Flushing Park. So I think it's a very elegant transfer station. Uh, maybe elegant's too precious. It's not that clean, but it's an ele it's elegantly designed uh, station that allows you to get to a lot of places. Um, Lisa, I did get you. And, and my favorite data set is the uh subway hourly ridership data which is a, a version of something that's been out there for a while but it's a more granular version um part of my team is looking is working very hard on um converting more folks to use omni payments and so that data set actually contains what percent of people at every station is are using omni as a payment method and so it's something we use a lot to understand where we need to do more marketing or if there's some reduced fare activity that we want to help get people into omni cards we kind of know where to go with our, our retail effort and so it's a really it's a new and improved data set um, that, that we use regularly. But again, for me, it's the kind of thing that we want out there to let other folks understand that and, and you know, get us ideas if we haven't, if we haven't seen a certain angle. Um, Lisa, I, I don't want, maybe you should just uh, make sure your bagel and, and data set is covered before I get into the meat of this here. Sure. My favorite data set is our subway elevator and escalator availability data set. It's a really detailed data set that Beyond showing you what percentage of time those assets are available in the system, it shows you where they are. So if you're looking to find where an elevator is located, it's a great one to check out. And Nikki, do you want to highlight your data set? Sure. Uh, so it's also foreshadowing what I'm going to demo later today, but the MT Statement of Operations data set, it's one of three of our budget data sets that we recently released. And I worked on it, so it's already one of my favorites, but I think it's also really cool that we were able to release uh, budget data for the first time. Okay, um, so let me, we're gonna do a few things here before we get to the Q&A, which I know is, you know, that we definitely wanna make time for that and have a little more interaction here, but for folks on the call who are newer to this and then maybe not as close to it as you know, folks like Noel have been sponsoring the journey for a while, we wanna make sure we're covering all bases here. Um, so we'll run through these things uh, and I'll talk for about five minutes here and then hand it over to uh, Lisa and Nikki to go into more detail on the operating budget itself. If you want to go to the next slide, one more. Um, so again, this is a slide we use with our board, actually. I don't. I think everyone on this call probably understands this, <laughs> but you know, at that point we were like reminding the board how important it is for us to comply with the law in this case. Um, you know, you can imagine the people on this call at the MTA are actually the most, you know, uh, we promote it a lot internally. We are strong proponents of this and the ethos behind it um, and are all totally on board in making this happen. Um, we also have had to get into the details as why has it been hard here besides just the maybe some resistance to the philosophy. You know, the way data exists here has also been complicated. Um, and it's a very, you know, it's a large company, 70,000 employees. There's kind of you know six different operating units that all are used to doing their own thing, and so while it might seem simple to say you can the MTA just put all its data out there, um, if it were unmanaged, it would just be a hodgepodge of stuff that is not kind of standardized or has consistent metadata. And so we really had to create a unit from scratch, which is what Lisa has done, to manage that and how we bring it all in from these different groups to make it in a standard that you all would expect to happen if you really want to call this thing open data. Um, so again, we 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 feel strongly about this, but it, it's been you know a, a journey for the MTA to dedicate the resources to, to doing this. Um, the next slide. Um, with that law in 2021, as as, as Noel mentioned, you know, we were we had, there was a roadmap that said we were going to do a lot of data sets you know, over a certain period of time because at that point I think the MTA's credibility on this had been a bit uh, what would we say um, ex I don't know exposed maybe is the right word, but it certainly compromised, and I think we wanted to move quickly and 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 steadfastly. And this slide shows you all the data sets that we have put up in the last three years. Um, each one of those to the standard that you would expect with having the right metadata, the right sustainability, the right ability to sort of um, download it and do different things with it, as well as we've tried to do a little bit of how it's presented to you, a, a more layperson and who just wants to use some basic use. Um, and every one of these data sets required you know, Lisa and or her team to go into the you know data owners of this somewhere across those six operating agencies or headquarters to pull out the data and set up a process for us to ingest it regularly, clean, sanitized, or sanitized free of debris and errors, I should say, um, so that you folks can sort of use it uh, as you will. Um, 
At the same time, again, we're trying to design the provision of it so that other folks in the MTA can use it at the same time. So there's we're, we're getting rid of you know, emails that said, hey, can you give me the data set on blah, blah, blah. It's like no, the data set is in the cloud. You can you can access it like everybody else, and it's actually organized, you know, very well with a, a data dictionary and everything else. So I'm very proud of what you know Lisa and her team have done, and and you know again try to support this sort of every turn. The um, uh, we continued it. There's a schedule that sort of will continue on that, and we'll talk a bit about that in in a second. But again, a, a lot done so far. Um, we we come into this knowing we have different types of users on here. Uh, you know, and again, you know, we've got maybe on this call some uh, a variety of these users uh, themselves. You know, uh, probably a lot of software developers. We we know some nonprofit staff are on here, um, and some other educators and students. Um, but we you know we try to make sure we're got putting something out there that all this kind of these sort of segments can use um, without a lot of sort of back and forth with us or the owners. We want to make it self serve and sort of just uh, self evident what these data sets are, um, and always open to feedback on that. And there's a lot of up a lot of ways to give feedback if the data sets not what you expect or the definitions fall short uh, in terms of what uh, in, in what you're looking for. Um, the uh, I think you know all of these. I, I think the segmentation has been important you know, for us to think about. We use a version of this slide and the, the funny icons to kind of make it real and realize this isn't just like a compliance thing. Like we need to meet the law. It's like we want to satisfy these groups, which we think all help us run a better railroad, so to speak. Um, and so again, we, we we think a lot about it, and I, and I again appreciate the that customer orientation that Lisa and her team have brought to the work. The uh, some upcoming releases that are happening, uh, you, you can see on here overall. These are ones that are in the works now. Things that you guys have advocated for, and we're and always glad to have advocacy and have a bit of steer on our prioritization. Um, but things like BNT crossings, you know, we've been you're know, looking to get into for a while. The capital budget is one that I know has been. There's a lot out there, a, a lot of detail out there, but it's not always as intuitive as we think it can be. Um, and we know that it's you know it's a large amount of spend. You know, some fifty billion dollars allocated to certain projects in certain areas. Um, and so we want to make that even more digestible. Um, it is a complicated beast, and that you know those of you close to it know that for every capital project, there may be a different source of funding for that project. You know, there may be some federal dollars, there might be some state dollars, there might be a, a developer that's putting some money in, and they may also come in at different times. Uh, and so it's actually very hard to explain it easily, given the possible combinations of funding for any given project. Projects also may have a change order, and that funding is different than the original funding. So, so please know this isn't a matter of us not being interested. It's really a matter of just the comp complexity that does to sort of put that out there in a way that we think will reduce questions, not just instantly bring more questions about the data. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about these three data sets, which is also, you know, these are sort of, it looks sort of banal, but actually very meaningful. Um, I remember being in my previous job at city planning, you know, always wondering why the MTA made it so hard to look at data, especially their financials and that they were not you know, machine readable. And it was almost you know designed to make it impossible to understand. Um, but again, proud to say with this, you know, very recently, and again, part of why we want to do beta bagels is to say, this is sort of out there. Or anybody to look at, you know, for the first time with a, a fair bit of history. Um, this wasn't just Lisa's team, but as I mentioned before, the data owners are quite relevant. So Jay Patel and, and David Keller and Steve Weiss, who are deputy chiefs of the CFO's office, you know, had to get intimately involved in how these are being produced and, and can making sure that their teams can continue to give it to us in a reliable way, and that they think it's a fair representation of what were in those, you know, PDFs which have probably existed for decades. And so there was a bit of a reinvention there that we hope you don't totally feel, but it just feels a lot more available than before. Um, and again, we're, we're, we, it was a big milestone to do this, even though it's kind of just our financials um, that again, at least in our team had to sort of uh, move through. Um, the last thing I want to mention before I hand it off to the, Lisa and, and her team and, the, and Nikki in the detail is like, we've also launched a blog um, in the interest of sort of sharing a little more about how this all comes together. Um, and I think that that's good for a lot of reasons. One, just for you know, more sharing of our learnings with others out there. Um, the other is, you know, I think for more awareness that this is sort of complicated and it's not, you know, it, it's not, you know, don't always assume the worst in terms of like they're trying to obscure things. You know, sometimes it's just very hard to get this data out and put it out there. Um, again, I think through these kind of sessions and other interactions you have with the team, I hope you feel that they have the support of MTA leadership to do things. And they're also very hardworking. It is a matter of like you know, prioritizing and doing the work uh, behind the scenes to get the data to be 
accurate enough for public consumption um, and, and easily understandable. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested in this kind of thing, to get into the blog, and there's, there'll be a, a, a link in the chat later where you can sort of get into that. But I think there's both kind of the ins and outs of data analytics, and we get a little, little bit along the way about why, um, how, how things are behind the scenes at the MTA for data. With that, um, let me hand it over to Lisa to uh, go through um, uh, a little bit of our budget overall, and then we'll get into the data sets themselves. Um, I, I will be here and, and try to stick around for all the questions in case something comes up. I've got a couple other things going on in the background today, um, but uh, I, I will hopefully be around for the questions, but I, I feel like Andy and Lisa can handle them if they do have to step away. Okay, great. Thanks, John. So uh, before we do a demo of the budget data sets, I want to go over a quick budget 101, just in general, and then also at the MTA, because I think the budget process at any organization is incredibly complicated, and knowing a little bit of background before you dig into the data sets is so useful. So just as like a headline item, MTA's budget is really a manifestation of our priorities given the available level of funding that we have. It's a means to share the cost of providing service and how the MTA manages long-term cost increases, invests in the future, and maintains affordable fares. So today we're going to be talking about the operating budget specifically, which plans for the day-to-day -day costs of running our subways, buses, trains, and operating our bridges and tunnels. Costs associated with keeping our system in a state of good repair is really relevant to the capital budget, which as John mentioned, we hope to publish more data on in the future. But today we're just gonna be focusing on the operating budget. So when we talk about budget data, I think one key thing to understand is the difference between budgeted data and actuals data. So for the MTA, we plan on the, we plan our financials on a calendar year basis. And we publish three plans every year. Uh, we have a July plan, a November plan, and a February plan. I won't go into details about this. The slides will be shared later. And we have lots of documentation with each data set, which Nikki can point out how to access that. But I think a key point to notice is that we have actuals values, which are published every month, which is exactly how much the MTA spent or earned. And then we have the budgeted values, which is what we projected to spend or earn. And these are two separate things and different ways of looking at the data. And you can also use them in combination with each other to find like the variances per month of what we expected to spend and how much we actually did. So that leads us into revenue versus expenses. I think this is like the very basics of budget data. So revenue is the income earned from selling goods or services, whereas expenses are the cost incurred in producing or offering them. Uh, so I think under revenue here, we can see the main ways the MTA generates revenue are through fare box revenue and toll revenue. And then under expenses, we have a lot of different types of expenses, which can be broken down into labor and non-labor expenses. Uh, I think a key point I wanna make here is, uh, we'll demonstrate this in one of the visuals later, but like the MTA generates revenue through our fare box and tolls. And when, when COVID hit, that was such a big impact on MTA's operating budget because that's really how we, how we generate revenue to cover our expenses like payroll or materials or our electricity bills. And there was a point in time where the MTA didn't know if we could cover those things. And you can see that now in the financial data. Um, another type of I would say almost revenue that the MTA receives are taxes and subsidies. And we receive these from the state of New York, businesses, individuals, and other localities in the MTA region. So yeah, subsidies can be thought of maybe another sub box to revenue because they do help us cover our operating expenses. If we have time, we'll go through a few of these, but I listed some examples of the different categories of subsidies that are available in the data set, as well as examples of each types of, of subsidies. So for example, we do receive a subsidy from the Connecticut Department of Transportation, which covers some of the operating costs of Metro North Railroad that runs into Connecticut. We receive subsidies from New York City that covers operating costs for a portion of our bus routes. Uh, and yeah, there's lots of detail about the different types of subsidies we receive in the, the data set documentation, as well as on the MTA website. 
Our subsidies data is shared on both a cash and accrual basis, whereas our other data sets are just shared on an accrual basis. So these are two different types of accounting, and I think it's important to understand the difference between the two. So accrual basis is a form of accounting where we recognize the revenue when it is earned and not received. So think credit. If we know we're paying for something, but the cash hasn't, hasn't actually transferred hands yet, that's being taken into account on the accrual basis of accounting, whereas cash basis is when like the actual money changes hands. So in our statement of operations data set, we just show this on an accrual basis. It's really a more accurate picture for the financial health of the agency. But for our subsidies data set, we share this on both basis. And this can be helpful because the MTA is often promised a subsidy or funding, but then doesn't receive it until later. And you can see this impact in our financials. And last slide before we dig into the actual data sets. As part of this publication, we share headcount data. Uh, headcount data uh, really establishes position levels uh, budgeted for each department. And these can change based on strategic resources or reductions in areas where operations are being made more efficient. And then we also sometimes add positions where more personnel are required. I do want to highlight that this data set, maybe at first glance, will look a little weird. And you'll notice that there are values that are negative or have decimal places. We are very aware of these <laughs> existing. And there's a lot of explanation in the documentation as to why this is. It did take our team a while to figure this out. But it depends on the way that each agency budgets for their headcount. Sometimes they pay by the hour, and that adds up to a full-time position. You can also split the funding for a position between whether it is reimbursable by the capital program or not. So this data is all, I guess this is all to say that this is all very complicated. And once you really dig into the details, I think you'll notice um, really interesting things about the way that the MTA runs and is operated. So uh, as John mentioned, we're going to talk about three data sets today, our statement of operations, subsidies, and headcount. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Nikki, who's going to do a little bit of a demo. And I think this will be yeah, pretty interactive. So if you want to follow along, you're welcome to do so. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, John, for the overview of the open data team, as well as the budget data sets. Um, I'm going to share my screen, walk through some of the open data sets. I'm not gonna go too much into how the portal works because we do have a blog post about that. Um, John highlighted the blog post that we recently mentioned uh, or recently released about just how the budget data came to be and more of the technical components of how we extracted and transformed the data. Um, but we also have one, as I mentioned, about how to use the Socrata query platform um, and how to access the data uh, as well as visualize it. So I think I'm sharing my screen now. Um, this is the statement of operations budget data set. So this is one of the ones that Lisa touched on. Um, you can access this on the Data NY Gov website. You can search for it, or I believe the links are in the chat as well. Um, and with the visuals that we're going to make, we're also going to send you published versions of them. So feel free to either follow along or just reference them later and try and recreate them. So um, here is the data set on the portal. And... If you want to learn more information about the data set, just a quick glance, you can just scroll down. Um, it gives you a nice quick overview of the columns in the data set, as well as some information about them. Um, if you click on the show more, you can also access our documentation and data dictionary. So with regards to just understanding the data set, I highly recommend looking at the documentation for it because it gives you a pretty in-depth description of all of the like mapping categorical values. And as Lisa mentioned, this is a very complicated data set just because there are so many variables that go into um, putting it together as well as understanding financial data. So highly recommend 
utilizing this. Um, I think in terms of any sort of visualization or understanding of data, this is a great place to start where you can, for example, scroll through this. And if you see a topic that you find very interesting, you can then, um, well, I'll show you now how to then like create a visual based on it. So um, for example, if we wanted to better understand a part of the operating revenue, uh, for this example, we chose Fairbox revenue, um, which Fairbox revenue represents the revenue generated from writer fares to use our services. We can then go back to the um, portal and the way you access a visualization is through this actions button. Um, and there's a few different things that you can do with it. But like I said, reference the blog post for how to more elaborately use this. We are just going to create a visualization. I'm not gonna sign in, but you are able to sign in if you have an account with the um, NY government website, and then you can save your visuals and share them later. Okay. Um, also, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. My team will be able to respond or I can maybe make adjustments to what I'm gonna show you. Uh, I know visual sometimes aren't that exciting, but I'll try and keep it very informative. Um, so for Fairbox revenue, in terms of using this data, because there is so much data and it's quite complicated with all those dimensions, we do highly recommend you basically filtering as much as possible to then derive some sort of insight. And data visualizations, I think there's so much uh, content on the internet about just different types of visualizations and ways that you can make really nice uh, displays of information. Today, we're gonna be walking through more of like a exploratory data visualization where we had a question that we basically found in the documentation, and now we're trying to better understand it by um, using this portal, applying all the filters, and then trying to find some sort of trend. Okay, so for Fairbox revenue, um, that is actually a general ledger line item type. Um, and in terms of all the mapping fields, you can also see like a display of the data set here which is I think helpful and like knowing what types of filters you wanna apply. Um, and once again, these mapping fields and the organization of the data is all described in the data set. Okay, so first we wanna filter for when the general ledger is fair box revenue. Um, and then I think it's also very helpful to apply filters to the scenario, fiscal year, financial plan. Um, so we're just gonna look at actual scenario to see what the actual revenue was. Um, and then I think as far as expense type, there's reimbursable and non-reimbursable, but here we see we only have reimbursable values. I'm going to choose a timeline chart so we can start seeing the data come together. Um, fiscal year. Okay. Uh, it's also really helpful to group dimension values because um, right now, if everything's displayed, uh, in one go, it can be um, hard to read. Oh, and I think this is aggregating by some sort of counter bros. Well, ooh, okay. Um, so now that we made sure that we are aggregating by amount, which you can see is the y-axis here, and our x-axis, which is the dimension, is the month. So this is a helpful way to visualize uh, what this fair box revenue line item amount looks like over time. And we find this to be pretty interesting because fare box revenue is essentially what we're getting from people using the service. And as you can see, there is quite a dip uh, early 2020, um, which can be attributed to COVID. So 
in terms of um, understanding the performance of the MTA or like the ridership and how much we're making from that over time. You can clearly see that there was a big dip during COVID, but there's been a pretty steady increase since then. So I think that's been nice. Uh, there's also some kind of neat ways that you can maybe better organize the data. Like I will make a title for this. Over time. Um, legends. So because I grouped it by the different agencies, I think it's also helpful to display the agencies here. And I'll just add some access titles left. This clear. Cool. Um, so yeah, you can see that obviously uh, NYCT, which is uh, the subway and buses, has the most amount. Um, and you can tell the trend line of that one very clearly, but you can also obviously add a filter to understand one agency at a time. Uh, if there's no questions about this, I can also move on to... Um, Oh, MTA BC is uh, MTA bus buses, and then MNR is Metro North. And in terms of um, payment information, we don't have this data set broken out by uh, payment of Omni or Metro Card, but there are other data sets that have that information. And I saw on the chat earlier that some of you are really interested in congestion pricing as we all are. So just know that you can kind of apply this methodology to those data sets that are released, um, which will also have financial information. Okay. I'm just gonna reset this and then show you maybe a more quick visual. So maybe we can make a visual if someone wants to very quickly look at revenues um, compared to expenses in the MTA. So this is also going to be the actual scenario. I find that the actual scenario as well as adopted budget, which is the February plan, those are the two scenarios I use most often. Um, So I'm gonna choose total revenue and expenses. Uh, you'll also notice in the operating data set that we have non-cash liabilities and debt service expenses, which are smaller amounts in the data sets. Uh, non-cash liabilities are of course what we owe or things like depreciation, environmental remediation are included there. Debt service expense is just um, information related to debt used for operating purposes. So again, to make sense of the data, uh, I think it's helpful to group it. And in this case, we're looking at bigger categories uh, type as opposed to a specific general ledger item. And a rose. Um, okay, so I think most of you know that the MTA uh, has more operating expenses than uh, revenue every year. So I think this is just uh, a neat visual to show versus expenses to show that trend, essentially. You can also organize the data in slightly different ways.
heart sorting. There we go. Um, cool. And in terms of the way that the data is organized, type, subtype, general ledger, I do have one of our operating statements pulled up. This is essentially what we uh, are trying to allow users to recreate, which are these published reports that this one, for example, is uh, one of the monthly ones that's released in the MTA board and committee book website, which you can find on the transparency page of the MTA public website. Um, on a monthly basis, something like this is released. We'd like to think that having it in a tabular queryable format is just a quick way for all of us to get insights from it, as opposed to reading these PDFs, finding the page number, et cetera. So um, I know we just talked about Fairbox revenue, but in terms of the way the data is structured, we have different types, for example, here, revenue, expenses, um, non-cash liability adjustments, debt services. So when you see the type, subtype, general ledger, just know general ledger is like the lowest level of information. And then those subtype and type fields uh, are basically ways that we thought would be helpful to organize the data and to allow people to then like quickly identify it on the financial statements. Um, any questions? You can also come off mute. Um, Okay, so I will move on now to subsidies. Subsidies, uh, all these data sets come from this financial planning database called Hyperion, which is an Oracle product. Um, and subsidies is a subsection of the data set that includes our subsidies. Uh, also a really quick way to look at the data before you know you want to visualize it is to just look at this data tab uh, and then you can understand how the data is organized see if you find anything that you maybe want to go into a bit more um, for this example today we're just going to look at the Connecticut Department of Transportation subsidy for Metro North Railroad um, so this is a subsidy where Again, this is why the documentation is so helpful. You can get more understanding of the um, line items themselves and then proceed to ask questions with data visualization. So this is a subsidy that Connecticut pays uh, for use of the Metro North Railroad um, operations in Connecticut. So we're gonna go to the data visualization. Okay. Filters. Um, I think with regards to subsidies, um, subsidies are interesting for a few reasons. Obviously these are subsidies, basically money that the MTA is getting. Um, and because we're looking at the operating budget data sets, it's money we're getting for operations specifically. So I think an interesting question to ask here is what the MTA expects to get versus what we actually get. Um, and also using the, using like a time visual for this is a helpful way to understand the nuances of um, when we receive something. Okay, so Yeah. Where's oh scenario heading here? Okay, sorry. Um, we're gonna look at the actual and adopted budget scenarios. Like I said, I think these are the two um, most insightful ones. Oh. Financial plan year. Let me click 
line chart. So if, for example, we want to look at this Connecticut Department of Transportation subsidy um, in one year to see the difference of MTA receiving something versus uh, when we expected to receive it. We can visualize it like this. So in this example, we're gonna be looking at cash. And I think cash is a good way to know the um, status of an organization as it relates to like the current moment. But I think accruals are helpful to just understand what we uh, expect to receive as well. Oh. Not month. Cool. And again, if you group this by scenario, You can see that for basically in 2023, from January all the way to the end of August, everything that MTA expected to receive from Connecticut for this subsidy also equated to what we actually received. Um, and then somewhere starting in September, there was a bit of a variance. Uh, it does seem that like, you know, we eventually received the money. Um, so I think that's good. I think timing differences, like differences between budget and actuals are obviously expected for a lot of different reasons. Uh, in the financial statements that are released, there is more information about maybe why something like this could happen. Um, but I think it's helpful to look at the trends um here questions um let's see some other fun things you can do with this there's a couple questions in the chat i don't oh. know if them, um, or oh, there's a few. I don't know which ones are the most relevant to what you're doing right now, but um, feel free to ask them. Or if someone has a question relevant to what Nikki's doing right now, um, ask their question. You can raise your hand or save it for the end when we do Q and A. Yeah. Do we want to move into Q and A? I know. So we had one more visual plan for the headcount data set, but maybe we can put a link in the chat to that. It's publicly available, and so if you guys want to try building the same thing. You can do it after this, but maybe I'll speak to, yeah, uh, Danny had a question about various ways different departments record their financial data. So the negative values you can see. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, you you do see some negative values in the headcount data set. There's a term here at the MTA called a yogi, and it's a person who originally started working for one agency and then took a job at another agency, but they still remain on the payroll for the first one. And so it just ends up leading to some weird uh, values in the position data, and you'll see that reflected. As Renuma put in the chat, there's yeah a few other reasons as well, but this is all explained in the documentation, which we can put a link to. Um, Nicole asked a question about uh, putting together a case for platform barriers. I think this is an interesting one. So how much revenue is lost due to people on the tracks or a pushed passenger, et cetera? I think the most helpful data set we have right now on this topic would be our subway major incidents data set. Maybe Shal or Numa can put a link to that. So this shows by month, like the the number of incidents that occur that delay 50 or more trains and there is a category within that of people that are on the track bed or police or medical incidents and so i think maybe you could use that to combine that with either the financial data of fare box, re fare box revenue or our subway hourly ridership data set to see if there are impacts of like how many people are actually 
entering the system based on those major incidents could be interesting. I'd love to hear what you find if you look into that. And let me see, did I miss any other questions? Oh, Annie is asking about bus stop boardings, uh, bus stop boardings, either 15 minutes or hourly by route. We are working on this. Uh, so I think eventually it would be made public. Right now we just have it by bus route, but it would be very cool to put together the bus stop data in the near future. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Stephen, yes, feel free to ask about non-financial data sets. Can I come offline or hop into the, the microphone? So um, there are some friends at Cornell Tech uh, who have been archiving bus time um, uh, since its inception. And granted, there are, there are issues with bus time, um, you know, like deadheading, uh, relocation of uh, buses. But a few entrepreneurial data analysts are starting to look at bus time and try to understand street flow patterns as well as on street flooding, um, you know, like where essentially um, on street flooding is happening and we don't have necessarily sensors for it. the bus can be a um, uh, almost like an, a, pro a proxy sensor for it. Um, uh, it's also very important to know where um, there's uh, continuous congestion um, on, on dedicated uh, bus lanes. <laughs> Um, has the MTA ever explored uh, creating an archive of bus time uh, that we can kind of like refer back to? Yeah, yeah. so we've been working with more granular bus data. Uh, we had one of our data scientists give a talk about this at Transit Techies. I think that was recorded and I saw Isaac join. If he's still here, maybe he can share a link to that. Um, but Andy, sorry, I think I interrupted you. <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa, finish what you're saying. Oh, yeah, it's definitely an area that we're looking more into is just more granular bus data in general, whether it's an archive of bus time itself or something that we think has uh, that has been like more vetted and has better quality, I think is up for discussion. Yeah, I would just add to that. It's definitely something we would like to uh, release, but there's like a lot of uh, like some technical hurdles to release that much data to make sure it's like clean and usable and correct. We don't want to put out something that would be wrong. Um, but like, yeah, obviously it's something we want to do. Um, Austin Thanks. had a good nice. question about suggestions for setting up a open data program at a mid-sized transit agency. And I bet Beta NYC has some thoughts about this for their advocacy work that they did. Oh, go Triangle and Durham. I have written that before. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would say like find find your advocates who can help support and push for you. I'm really grateful for Beta NYC, people like Noelle and Kate. I would not have this job as, if it wasn't for them, and this program wouldn't exist if it wasn't for them advocating for more transparency. And I think something that also can help is just, uh, I think, communicating internally the value of open data in the sense that it it forces you to make data at your agency better quality and more usable to your own analysts. This operating budget project is such a good example of that where it was really difficult for anyone at the MTA to look at this budget data. And the fact that it's now on open data makes it more accessible to everyone who works here. I wonder, Lisa, if that question was meant like partly technically, not just sort of like uh, administratively. Like we we benefit a lot from the New York State Open Data Portal already existing uh, before we were like adding much to it. Um, like, how what would it take for someone to like do their own version of that on a smaller scale for their own agency? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there are there are open source platforms out there. If you don't have the budget to pay for like a Socrata or OpenGov license, but of course you do, you would need the budget to have staff to support an open source tool. So I don't know. I think we could, if you're interested in talking more offline, I'm happy to do that. 
Uh, and yeah, seeing some comments here about upgrading our subway entrance data set. Last update was in 2015. I fully intend to update that data set. It is very complicated as are all of our asset uh, data sets. So I know that MT has promised it before and there's a reason why it hasn't happened before, but we will try our best to get you an update. I was just going to piggyback on the um, lessons for setting up a open data program. Uh, Rachel Faust from reInvent Albany did a session at School of Data that's recorded that I'll share in the chat um, about the lessons learned from advocating for the MTA's Open Data Act. So I'll share that and maybe that'll have some more information for you. I was just going to add, um, there was a question on Omni and some like discussion on the value to the MTA of Omni. Um, like my understanding is sort of probably like a general one, but there's a lot less to maintain with Omni and like MetroCard is a very old system, like end of life. And so uh, we need to transition to something and like to go to open loop fair payment technologies means like there's people are bringing their phones and their credit cards and like using less of our like old vending machines and turnstiles and stuff like that. So it's like pretty basic reason. Yeah, any other questions or does anyone have like ideas for how they want to use MTA open data? Um, what questions they would ask and do analyses on? You can raise your hand or come off mute. Uh, we're sort of now in the final moments of the event. My, uh, my other question is, um, where can we get a list of all of the types of data that congestion pricing um, will be collecting or that would um, that we'd be able to see? I, I, I would love to just have a better understanding of the different types of, you know, fare systems, uh, camera accurate accuracy, um, revenue, like, you know, what particular um polls are are people most passing through um i'd love to see all of the collection of the data that you're thinking through and hopefully get some feedback from us so like the the basic answer to that noel is uh like a certain number of data sets are required in the legislation for um uh, for congestion pricing i don't think those are quite as granular as what you're talking about um but you can see the full list there in terms of what's going to be going up um and then Lisa, is it already up or are we putting it up soon, the, uh, the geometry info for the CBD? Yeah, so yeah, we just published our first data set, which is the CBD boundary. I think some on the team can share a link to that. But we do have a list of the data sets we plan to publish in the near future. It is on the MTA's Open Data Catalog data set. Uh, hopefully we'll be adding more. So if you have specific requests, just please let us know in the chat. You can also email us at opendata at MTAHQ. Uh, and yeah, we'd really, we'd love to hear what data you're looking for. Cool, we have two questions. I think I saw Scott's hand first and then Wayne. Yeah, hey, um, so uh, I'll, I'll admit I haven't looked yet, but I'm wondering if you have uh, data sets on um, mixed use bike demand. Uh, the question is motivated by uh, what I find is insufficient uh, bicycle uh, access on subways, uh, um, uh, subways, buses, uh, bridges, and I'm wondering if you have any access on the on the on what the demand is. Also, maybe versus the usage, right? So if you'd say, oh, you know, we filled up, uh, you know, every single car on this train with bikes. Uh, three weeks in a row, that, that kind of thing. I am almost certain we do not collect any data on that. So there's there's nothing to share. What 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 were you hoping we'd have exactly? Well, you know, you, you have ridership data, right? You know, this LIR car has, you know, 300 people on it. You know, oh, we had, you know, 50 bikes on, um, on this train or um I, I don't know you know to some yeah. extent um that would be that would be nice if we were able to count something like that the ridership data that we share from the subway and buses uh currently almost all just based on uh paid paid uh, swipes and taps from omni uh 
And then on the railroads, it's using weight sensors on the cars that are equipped with that to estimate the number, like the, the weight, and then divide by an average weight of person uh, based on some testing to get to like a number of people per car. That's how you see that real time information um, for the for the two railroads. But like this, neither of those systems is going to be able to count something like unique, you know, objects like bikes or whatever. If a bunch of bikes were on a Long Island Railroad car, we would probably make the assumption that those are like extra people based on how we how we calculate things. Okay, and then nothing on the bridges, like a you know a bike counter or sensor type thing. Not that I, on the bridges, all we count is uh like cars and vehicles passing, like vehicles we toll uh through the uh, easy pass points, right through the toll booth. So I, I've never seen data on bikes. I don't want to say we don't have it, but I'm like ninety nine percent sure we don't have that. Maybe maybe we could in the future, but I don't think we do currently. Thank you. I think um, DOT Noel has uh, bike trackers on the bridges, on some of the bridges, correct? Uh, not just the bridges. Well, it's all the East River bridges. There's, uh, there's sensor pads, but then there's a handful of sensor pads um, in the city uh, looking at thoroughfares. So there's one on Kent, and then there's another one um, someplace in Manhattan. Um, but yeah, they're little sensor pads that are doing bike counts. I know Numina, which is a, uh, a startup here in uh, the city, uh, has a sophisticated uh, array of tracking different types of uh, users, people and vehicles and buggies. And that's being used on the Brooklyn Greenway to understand Brooklyn Greenway use and uh, I know that there's a British company that the DOT has has contracted that's also looking at um, kind of like sensing. But it would be great to get uh, other than car sensors um, to really have us give us a better understanding of how the bridges could better accommodate non automotive vehicle traffic. All right, Wayne, um, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm curious if you guys have a data set on the specifically uh, towards like passenger satisfaction. Um, I'm interested in like building an analysis on just like uh, passenger satisfaction across different subway lines, um, complaints or issues reported by passengers. That's uh, the answer is yes. I know we I know what we have. Uh, Lisa, is it we don't share on open day, anything on that yet, do we? Yeah, unfortunately we don't put any of our survey data on open data yet. We've gotten a lot of requests for it though. Um, so I would definitely love to add it to the plan in the future. I think our work right now is pretty dictated by the 2021 open data law required the MTA to recreate a three-year plan of what we would share. And that data set wasn't on the plan, unfortunately, but uh, I'm definitely gonna work internally to try and get that added. We're currently working with the market research team to like try to simplify their workflows. The way they work is, uh, you know, currently pretty like time intensive to gather all their data and like they put a lot of reports out and board meetings and board materials. Obviously, it's not like open data in the machine readable sense that you're looking for. Um, but hopefully, after we've like helped streamline their workflow, we can uh, put out some of the data sets Lisa was talking about. Thanks, folks. All right, I think we have time for one more question and then we're going to go through um, a few just announcements and follow ups to end the event. Thanks for sticking around. Um, Lily, I see your hand raised. Yeah, um, just quick question. I think with Omni, it seems like there's an opportunity to get a lot more kind of user data about like regular routines and things like that. But there's also probably a, a way bigger privacy concern for those users. I'm curious how you all are thinking about like what kind of new Omni data will be collected and how you're going to like you know, make sure that the data isn't um, like exposing users' privacies in ways that, um, you know, is yeah. <laughs> troubling. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a good question. So the the way we handle the privacy issue with Omnimetric and basically everything else that like my team works on is that we just don't collect that information to begin with. Um, so we're not going to, there's no risk of us sharing it on, on open data. Um, anything we share in open data is almost certainly not going to be like transaction level. Um, maybe in the future we get towards something like that. But like, I think there's like even technical constraints maybe at the portal. Um, and so I don't think you're going to see like individual Omni uses or transactions in the open data more than likely. Uh, so that will like kind of handle all the privacy concerns. 
Um, one thing that we do want to uh, work on, I don't know what the timeline is for this exactly is, but um, we, you know, we've talked internally about having like aggregated what we call OD data, origin destination data. And that is based on both MetroCard and Omni. So internally we have a way of uh, estimating where passengers are going every time they swipe in, since we don't get swipe out information in New York City, right? Like you don't you don't interact with us again on your way out of the system. Um, we have to estimate where your trip ended based on where your next trip begins, right? So it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. And we use that internally all the time to like plan service, how many buses and subways we should have in different places based on where we see trips going. Um, so some aggregated version of that, I think, would get to a lot of the, um, uh, you know, questions people would have about about ridership. In terms of like things that are new from Omni uh, versus MetroCard, like Omni is pretty similar to MetroCard in terms of the data and the insights we're able to get from it. It is a little bit more granular in terms of like the time and location. Usually we get like a, for like an Omni use on a bus, we get the lat long versus just a, a account. So there's a few things like that. But in general, I think the insights we get from Omni for what our public interest and what we do internally are pretty similar to what we already have with MetroCard. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Nikki, for this great presentation. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions. Uh, this was really insightful. We just want to close with a few reminders of how you can stay engaged with Beta NYC and Civic Tech and Open Data in New York City. Um, if you go to beta.nyc backslash links, um, you'll find a number of ways to stay involved with us, including our Slack, our newsletter, which goes out monthly, just went out yesterday, and there's lots of announcements, including job uh, announcements and hiring. Um, we have a festival that we run every year in March. If you're not familiar with it, it's called Open Data Week, and it's a chance for everybody to learn about all the different ways people are using open data in New York City. And our call for proposals will launch sometime in the early fall this year, maybe even a little bit in the summer, potentially. Um, so start thinking if you're working with open data and you want to propose an event, start to think about that for 2025. Um, sounds crazy that we're saying that right now, but um, we are planning for it. Um, the what else we have um, our open data ambassadors we uh, are trained ambassadors trained new yorkers to teach classes across the city there's a class tonight if um, the demo was intriguing to you and you want to learn more about using the socrata platform to uh, look at and explore open data we offer a class tonight at six o'clock um, that will take you through what is new york city open data um, which is managed by the new york city open data team at the office of technology and innovation um, so you'll learn all about like just navigating 311 data and sort of some basics and it'll be at a slower pace um, and it's uh, open for beginners. Um, lastly, Beta Bagels and of course our annual conference that takes place at school at uh, Open Data Week called School of Data. Um, so now, yeah, uh, to final, to sort of just end, uh, we want to open the floor to you if you have an announcement, um, if you have ideas for future Beta Bagels guests. If you're searching for a job and you want to just sort of put yourself out there, please, you know, raise your hand, come off mute. This is a time for people to engage since we're not in person and you don't get that um, sort of networking opportunity. Um, all right, Noel, I see your hand raised. Yeah, um, I forgot to add that we have a pretty active online community uh, via Slack. Um, so. Uh, you do not need to wait till we're having, uh, you know, like these dedicated events. Um, uh, Gabby, who has been sharing links, uh, does a weekly roundup in our Slack. Uh, we also have a weekly roundup via LinkedIn, uh, where we're able to post uh, jobs, uh, events, uh, things that we're seeing, cool data sets. Um, so we have a heartbeat on the in-between. Um, uh, that being said, uh, we're also looking forward to putting together some other hacky uh, events, maybe with the MTA um, in the fall. Um, but come join us online uh, as we uh, in between all of the other things that we're doing. Yes, and if uh, nobody has any announcements right now, um, I think Lisa just put in the MTA is hiring an open data uh, intern or fall, fall intern for the open data team. And I don't know, Gabby, if you have any like announcements that you want to share based off of all the work from the newsletter. 
Um, no, I just seconding Noel's point about our, our Slack community. Um, I'll also drop in a link for our, our weekly newsletter. We always try to stay up to date and keep everyone updated. We know it's a um, interesting market right now. I know people are always asking for information. It's really an honor to be part of a team that gets to dig deep every week and share resources with people. So, yeah. Yeah, and if you have announcements in the future, you can always submit them to us as well. Um, to include in our newsletters. So, Stephen um, added a comment here. Stephen, do you want to come off of uh, mute and talk about your Pi? Pi data. Oh yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put out that I'm part of Pi Data NYC. We have an open. We have monthly meetups, usually at the uh, Microsoft Building in Eleven Times Square. And we actually have a conference coming up later this year, but we don't have, you know, dates or anything locked in quite yet. Uh, la last year, we actually had Martha Norick as a, a keynote speaker. And, uh, we, yeah, like I mentioned, like our main focus is data science and the Python language, but uh, we're open to other, other languages and we don't, we're just generally about data science. And anyone from, you know, like academia or industry or just whoever has something to say, interesting to present. And uh, I mean, I'm also part of NUM Focus, the Affiliate Project Selection Committee. We oversee the open data science stuff, such as NumPy, Pandas, Polars, probably a bunch of other ones that people uh, use. In the part of and uh yeah i just wanted to put out the uh, open call for speakers uh thank you so much for letting me speak great thank you stephen um i think i see uh uh somebody habiba put in the chat that she's looking for a new role and shared her linkedin uh or sorry their linkedin profile um if anybody else wants to share their linkedin please do connect we hope that this results in fruitful connections. And I'm aware that we're over time. So thank you again. Um, one, I guess, final thing, you know, if you like these events, if you wanna continue to support Beta NYC, you can support us directly. You can also um, give us ideas for sponsors for events like these and future festivals and conferences where we'd love to hear ideas. So um, without further ado, yeah, have a great day. And uh, 